Okay, Home Theater 102. Home Theater 101 was probably like a year ago. I'll uh, link to it in the description. Uh, just out of the blue, I decided this is a good thing to do. I figure the holidays are coming up. You're gonna want some advice on receivers. In Home Theater 101, I sort of went over my general home theater and what I've done with it, and it really does not matter because what I've done to my home theater is weird. But, in general, people ask the same questions about their surround receiver. Mine is a Tascam PAR200. I bought it on eBay, brand new, seven years ago for $300. This was over a thousand dollar receiver. It had DTS-HD, it had Audacity, it had uh, Sirius XM built in, True HD, and nine inputs, it was ridiculous. Here's what you need to know about buying a surround receiver. Don't overspend. I would have not bought this unit for $1,000. 300 was the right price. Here's what you need to figure out first. What's in your home theater? What's in your living room? What are you trying to actually hook up? Forget the amount of speakers you want. Forget the, the, the features you want for a second and figure out what you're actually hooking up to it. Because one of the things that I don't use is all the HDMI's back here because in reality all I have is my home theater PC which sits here and that's it so automatically I can forget looking at receivers that claim to have nine inputs 12 inputs they have com composite and they I just need one I just need one I will touch on separates near the end of this video but for now just basic home theater picking ideologies so, when people ask me which receiver I should get, or they ask me, hey Zeos, what receivers do you, have you tried? Here's the problem. I can't try receivers I go to literally, you know, Best Buy and start touching them. They're not exactly like headphones where you get a set, borrow it, send it back. So, the only thing I could say to start off, figure out what you're plugging into it. Do you have old game consoles? Do you have an old VCR? Do you want to plug your Dreamcast? I will always bring the Dreamcast up. Always, until the Dreamcast 2 comes out. Um, how many things are HDMI? Do you need front inputs? Once you've got that worked out, the next and the most important thing is you pick a reliable brand. Brand. Not model, not specific model, in a, brands. Because usually the brand will carry over its feature sets and its problems throughout. Now, the order that I recommend um, if you can afford it, Marantz first. Marantz makes quality stuff. It's expensive, but it's quality. But it's so expensive, you may have to look down. Now, not looking very far down is Denon. Uh, if at home, my parents' house, we had a Denon, we had a Denon that replaced a Denon, we had a Denon that replaced a Pioneer, it was Denon. So basically, the top three brands I usually recommend are Marantz, Denon, or Yamaha. Yamaha gets a pass because they have a very different layout as far as like inputs. Where's my remote for this? Whereas this says literally DVD, cable, satellite, game, FM, PC, auxiliary. Yamaha has HDMI one, two, three, four. You have to remember what you're doing. You could label it in the software, but that's it. Uh, reliability. Onkyo. In the day, back in the day, a few years ago, probably more like five years ago, Ankyo was having problems with their HDMI boards on their entire line. HDMI input would fail. Just a year later, you bought a receiver, a year later, no signal. And that was something that sort of scared people away from Ankyo. Now I'm sure they fixed that in all their newest revisions, but it still leaves them below the top three on my recommendation. Pioneer, here's the thing about Pioneer. Their cheap stuff used to be just okay, and their elite stuff is great. So I can't recommend Pioneer unless I say Pioneer Elite. Now their Pioneer Elite stuff is like Marantz or higher levels of pricing. So that's what you're looking at there. Now there's other offshoots like Toyota and Lexus are the same company. You go buy a Lexus, you're buying a Toyota with an L on it instead of a whatever the symbol is for Toyota. So Integra is made by Onkyo. And in fact, this Tascam, is an Integra 
that Onkyo made, which is why this remote, if you look up Onkyo remote, this one shows up. So you gotta be careful if you're looking at brands, Insignia, uh, Harman Kardon. Harman Kardon is like, who fucking even? Like I've never had any good things heard or said about Harman Kardon. We're gonna talk about Sony for a split second too. I've not used their new stuff, but their old stuff was trash, hot garbage. Like literally get a blowtorch and just light a bag of fire in the Bronx. And when it burns its brightest, that was a Sony receiver back in the day. My cousins, we had to unscrew it and have a piece of wood pushing down a part of the board or sound didn't come out. That sort of bad. So Sony might be good now. Sony has amazing televisions. My Sony CRT and then the new Sony TVs are fucking amazing. I don't trust them for audio yet. They're getting better. They're, the headphones and the headphone amps are really high-end stuff. But their entry-level Sony receivers, I would just not. 1% total harmonic distortion plus noise is not good. You're looking at like less than a quarter of a percent if you're ever looking at the specs. All right, specs. So now you've figured out what you're plugging into it. So you know you don't have to worry about something that has too many inputs. You know the brands to stick to. Marantz, Denon, Yamaha, followed by Onkyo, followed by Pioneer Elite. And then you gotta look for the offshoot brands like Insignia and things like that. Do not buy a pile, by the way. Are there any other brands I'm forgetting? Harman Kardon, no, okay. Next, power. So here's where the people get real confused. Most surround receivers, most, not all, but most, put out anywhere from 85 watts to 125 watts per channel. And they think that matters. Here's the thing about power. It doesn't matter when it's that close. If you want to add three decibels, three decibels of volume, which is the equivalent of this, hold on, I'm a human, uh, no, it's actually like, it was like six decibels. Uh, you wanna add that much, you need double your wattage. When I, people ask me about wattage, like this one has 85 watts and this one has 92 watts, irrelevant. 85 to 100, irrelevant. 100 to 105, doesn't matter. Wattage is a rough top. You'll never push, if you push the maximum wattage on anything, you've done something wrong. A lot of surround receivers, if you're going for heavy duty, like I said, I was gonna talk about it later, for separates, what a separates is, this is a surround receiver. It's called a receiver because it does everything. You get all your signals and then it powers your speakers with amplifiers built in. Separate system is everything but the amplifiers are built in to a processor, which I actually have one in this room. Here is my Emotiva MC700 processor, and this has no amplifiers in it. It just takes HDMIs in the back and has RCA outputs, and you use your own amplifiers. If you're looking for more power than like 120 watts max, you have to go with something like that. Now, this unit has pre-outs as well. So you could ignore the amplifiers built into it and get yourself a set of Crown 2502s that could put 1,550 watts into a speaker, which is what I have. You have one for each. I could have another one for the center. I could have another one for this speaker right here. I could have a 15,000 watt amplifier if I wanted to because pre-outs exist on my receiver. So. Getting back to the topic of wattage, don't worry about it. The only time you need to worry about wattage is if you're looking at the slimline receivers. Marantz has five, $600 slimline. This is a full size. They have ones that are half this height and they're beautiful and they fit into cabinets better and it's wonderful. A lot of them are 50 watts a channel. So remember how I said doubling is what matters? When you take a 100 watt per channel receiver, cut that to 50, and then try to use the same speakers that were getting 80, 90 watts when they were really pumping, that's when you have to worry. But if you ever see a receiver that's 200 watts a channel, it's probably lying to you. Another thing is, receiver has seven speakers it has to deal with. 
that's this many. I wanted to make sure. And usually the rear channels, you'd think they wouldn't need the power, but front channels are big and usually efficient with lots of drivers. And these rear channels, little tiny speakers. Oh, they don't need much, but they actually probably need more power to get to the same volume because of efficiency's sake. You're also running longer cable runs around your room. So saying something is 100 watts a channel times seven, 700 watts is a lot. And it will probably all be pulling from the same power supply. So if everything in your system is inefficient, your receiver is going to get very hot. If you have very efficient speakers, larger speakers, or you choose to not do um, 7.1, do 5.1 with a 7.1 receiver, you can sort of leave the power supply to do individual speakers less. In fact, some receivers back in the day used to actually put out more power in the front channels if you weren't using the rears. Um, quickly going to go over 5.1 versus 7.1. I think I covered this in the 101 home theater video, but I'm going to do it again. That is determined not by your will, but by your room. Where my couch is now is not correct. My couch belongs the back of it here. That yellow, that orange speaker and that orange speaker are the side speakers. Those are the fronts. I don't personally run a center channel. Every receiver you buy worth its muster, you go into the menu and you could set up are those small speakers in front, large speakers in front, or none? Well, actually, you can't set fronts to none, but you can do small, large, or none for the center. When you do none for a center, it takes the signals that are all the voices and gunshots, and it pushes them to the left and right. Now that it's there, you get a center image. It's like listening to music. You ever listen to music? I'm sure some of you have. You ever notice that maybe you hear the guitar a little bit more there and maybe you hear the trumpet a little more there but the singer is usually like floating magically in the center same thing happens with movies when you take a center channel away uh putting a center channel here would be fine except for the fact that i don't want one and if i have guests over it's usually only on this couch maybe two or three so we can get away with not having one. If I have people sitting here, if Chewbacca's in her box and she wants to watch television, she will definitely get more of a signal source from that than that, and it will sound weird. But if there's a center, she would hear the voices coming directly from the center of the screen. Again, that's another topic that I've covered already. We did branding, we did power. Again, power doesn't matter. If anything near 100, it's fine. Now, that's being said, a cheap $200 receiver saying 100 watts per channel and a $1,500 receiver saying 100 watts per channel, there's going to be some slight differences. Just the same with everything else. The, the quality of the watt will vary, and that's going to be directly proportional to the amount of money you're paying for it. How big the transformer is. Those pile amplifiers can claim 200 watts a channel for a microsecond at 180% distortion. Don't trust ratings, trust reviews. That's the way I go about this. If you, hear, if you are looking for a receiver, you're gonna find one by a brand that I trust because I've dealt with all these questions. You're gonna find one with the inputs you need, the minimum spec. It's okay to get the minimum spec. If you look at the Denon lineup and there's a $250 starter receiver, then a 350, then a 500, then a six, then an eight, then a nine, then a 12, then a $2,000 one, you probably would not benefit in the slightest from going up to these top ones if you're only doing a 5.1, you have relatively efficient speakers, and you only have like four things to plug into it. The only things that you gain from going up and up the totem pole is features, which is our next topic of discussion. Features. So, I am not a huge fan. Like. I wasn't a huge fan of smart TVs with the apps and all the bullshit. I was like, get a Roku and everything else. I'm still not like sold on that, but audio return channels exist, which means your television can usually push through HDMI. If you have a smart app on your new television, it could tell the receiver what audio to play. I'm not into the receiver being able to load an Amazon app and load a YouTube app and anything. I think they're pretty much avoiding that, which is good because the most important thing about a receiver that you should know, is it's probably going to change the most in your setup. And I don't mean change like be the biggest difference. I mean 
five year shelf life, the end. A TV could last you a decade. Speakers could last you 20 years. But that receiver, sources will come and go. But that receiver, this receiver you're looking at that was $1,000 that I paid three for is wholly outdated. Doesn't even have, do you see 4K written anywhere on this? I don't. And if I ever got a 4K television, that's a 1080p television. I run a 1080p projector. There's my 104 inch 21 by nine screen. If I ever changed anything to 4K or got a 4K source, this has to be taken out and thrown out the window. Receivers are disposable. And that's scary because most people want to buy things forever and you're not going to be able to do it. Everything's going to change. First is 4K, then there's 4K with HDR, then there's HD 10 bit color, then we got, oh, we got the streaming service. Oh, which version of HDMI? My brother bought a fucking beautiful used Marantz. It weighs 55 pounds. It's 150 watts a channel in the front, and I believe it. HDMI 1.2. You know what that means? That means anything higher than 30 hertz, it can't do. He literally has to, he can't use the receiver to push 1080p signal up to his television because it's got too many colors. That's the problem with receivers. They're here, they help, the amplifiers in that unit are amazing. If you had a hi-fi setup with no display, I would say buy one of those old Marantz, plug in an RCA from a DAC, plug in your speakers, and you could live happily ever after. My father has a Pioneer, actually I stole it from him, but I don't have it here. A Pioneer VSX D1S, 130 watts per channel, Japanese made surround receiver. Surround, because that was in the days before anything but ProLogic. That is a mother of an amplifier with total harmonic distortion numbers like 0.003%. Unheard of today. No digital inputs. Doesn't decode any real surround sound. It can fake surround sound. But that's the state of every receiver as soon as you buy it. As soon as it's born, it starts dying. Get as many, if, if and when this projector goes, which it is starting to flicker, I have the choice of buying another bulb for a seven, eight year old projector or upgrading, which I'm much more likely to do now that I have this life. And if I upgrade, I'm getting a 4K. And if I get a 4K, I'm not gonna run a 1080p signal to it, am I? And if I'm not running a 1080p signal to it, then I'm gonna have to change my television out too. So that'll be 4K and that'll be 4K. And where does that leave you, Mr. Tascam? Because I love you. I really do. You have all the modes a man could ever want. And I'm serious, it does. If I could switch through them right now, which is not letting me. Um, we were talking about features. So don't look for smart features like streaming. Don't worry, like this had serious audio. Who gives a shit? There's a reason that these things are loaded with inputs, uh, RCA inputs, coaxial digital inputs, four uh, SPDIF inputs, a ton of unused HDMI, because individual boxes, individual units will be much, much, hold on, I'm kicking that over there, kicking that over there too, much more useful to you than anything that could be built into this, because no matter what firmware upgrade you get, just being able to take a nook and say, oh, this nook is old, new nook, plug it right back into your receiver is fine. The, the very, very finite lifespans of these is determined wholly by you, what your needs are, what they become, and what the technology does. And I can't tell you what that is. No one can tell you what that is. I'm amazed I've made it eight years. If this had a, had a failure, I would cry. And if I had to upgrade anything, I would cry because this couldn't do it. I'd have to bypass HDMI and then run an HDMI, but just for audio and oh my God, nightmare. So. Don't look to invest. People love to invest in the best stuff. Invest in speakers, absolutely. Invest in amplifiers, absolutely. Don't invest in a surround receiver. It's gonna be here for a short time and then leave. It will be like investing in a VCR about one and a half years before fucking DVDs come out. Same thing, then you invest in that DVD player. How long did that last before HD DVD and Blu-ray? 
Then everyone invested in a DVD player or Blu-ray player. And now Netflix streams. So now what are you going to invest in? Invest in things like this. This will be here. If it breaks in 10 years, send it to Brooklyn and they'll fix it. If this breaks tomorrow, think Ankyo wants to get this back because the board died? Who cares? It doesn't even run 4K. It doesn't even run the newest Audacity. This is Audacity 2 EQ. And now we're going to talk about room correction because that's the last real major thing that people are foaming at the mouth of when we're talking about surround receivers. <sighs> room correction is the best thing. But I don't think a person should change their, should spend double the amount on something to get something well beyond what they need. They shouldn't make it the investment just because it has the upgraded room correction. I have an amazing room here. It doesn't look like it. That's a concrete wall. That's a wall. There's a nine foot ceilings, room to wall to wall carpet. But I have no reverb in here. It's a miracle without much work, without much effort. There's no reverb. When I put my speakers on, could they use room correction? Absolutely, everything could be room corrected. The best speakers I've reviewed are the MTM iLouds, which room correct with a little microphone, and those Genelex, which room correct. So you'd think you'd want that technology. And for a lot of people that have very strange rooms, a lot of echo, or hardwood floors, and only little area rugs, it will help. But, but, but don't go blowing four or $500 extra for it. There are other ways around that. Now, granted I'm using a computer and not like separate Blu-ray players or streaming services. If I stream, I would stream from my computer. I just go to Netflix and open it up in a web browser because that's how I run it. The room correction software is one of the things that upgrades the most. Like I said, five years. If you could upgrade with firmware, that's fine. But let me point you at something else. Now, I wish I could recommend this wholeheartedly and has no issues and oh my God, I can't wait to sell everyone one of these. This is a mini DSP and I plan on giving this a full review, but it's breaking my heart currently. You see, this is the, you actually have the name of what you are? Yes, the Nano AVR HD. And this is what the back of it looks like. Can you see? Do you see? So, Power, USB, Ethernet, HDMI 1 in, HDMI 2 in, HDMI out. What this unit does is take all of that, oh, I need room correction built in and rem take it out of there. And again, put it in a separate box. You want that to do very simple tasks. You want your receiver to take signals, decode them usually, and maybe amplify all the channels or just the rear channels, I'm not separately amplifying my rear channels, they're just coming out of this unit. 100 watts of channels, plenty for that, and that, and that, and that. It's sending out to my subwoofer just fine. I could interrupt the subwoofer out with another mini DSP and control, give bass management, a little bit more finite bass management. To do what you want with a receiver to the sort of level, now we're going to the advanced receiver talk. Are you ready for this? Let's talk advanced receiver stuff. You should have everything you need if you are just a basic buyer. I need a receiver, Zios. Okay, how much do you have to spend? Well, I don't really care about that. I just want these and these and this feature and this and this. Well, I taught you about wattage. I taught you about the inputs and feature sets. Don't hark on it being around for more than five years. It's gonna be obsolete. It's just planned obsolescence is the, the, this is the thing. And get a brand that you know the end. You can move on. You can leave this video right now and happily go out and buy a highly rated Denon receiver that if you go uh, 5.1 or 7.1, did I finish that? I never finished that rant. Shit. Sorry, this is Z reviews and I sort of don't have a internal monologue. Like I need a director. Real quick, going back. <clears throat> 5.1 versus 7.1. Most receivers are going to be 7.1. Just buy one of those. If you're not going to install one, don't worry about it. You could literally just not use the rear channels. The thing that determines going 5.1 or 7.1 is the room. Like I said, the couch isn't supposed to be there. The couch is supposed to be here. If the couch is here, I had the choice. If I want 5.1, I'd put the speakers in the back corners. 
But since I had enough room behind this couch to add two more speakers behind me, if this is where your couch sits normally, do not do a 7.1. Put your rear speakers there and there and you're done. Since I have the couch forward and I have five feet behind it, that's enough room to say I want back channels, not just rear channels. Then well, you no longer have rear channels when you do a 7.1, by the way. <clears throat> it goes from rear channel to side and back. So that's the determining factor. Can you fit five, six feet behind you and put another speaker? I could, I did it. Otherwise, one speaker per side's fine. Advanced. Switching to advanced surround sound mode. So we already talked about pre-outs, which if that interests you, you're probably gonna end up spending a shit ton of money in about, oh, I don't know, two hours after watching this video. Because that's when things get fun. So you can buy a separate surround processor like the Emotiva I showed you. And the problem with that is, for some reason, and no one on earth can tell me what this fucking reason is, when you take a beautiful surround receiver like this, with all its options and THX and memories and tuning modes and all the inputs, and you take the amplifiers out of it and just give you signal outs, it costs more money. I'm not giving that the finger, I'm giving the companies who make them because it's a supply and demand thing. The demand is high for receivers with amplifiers built in. The demand is very low for processors because nobody knows what they are. So they're only gonna sell a handful of processors. So in order to make it even worthwhile for them to make them, they need to make them expensive. Ta-da! Every surround receiver on earth, from $200 to $2,000, at some point in it, has just signal. And that signal goes to the amplifier. So all you have to do is tap that signal and then you can have a pre-out for everything. Now, pre-outs literally are only for the lunatics like myself or anyone who's like, yeah, I got these Ohm Walshes and they're not that efficient. And the 100 watts per channel coming out of them, I'm really pushing it, really pushing it. I want like three, 400 watts at the disposal of my home theater. So you have to have pre-outs. Now, the cheaper Morants, even the Slimline Morants are, always going to have at least the front channel preouts. So should it arise that you want to buy a vintage Pioneer Spec 2 amplifier, 250 watts class A, you could just say, you, you handle the center channel, the back channels and the side channels. Give me the RSA outputs from the front left and right. I'll put them to this fucking monster, which is not plugged in. And then this can handle the front channels. And that's like the most basic upgrade you can get moving out of normal receiver territory to I'm gonna start getting crazy. That being said, I'm more crazy because things like this exist. I'll talk back to this. We're, we're, we're getting way off topic here, but that's Zeos. He's trying to put it together. It's like National Treasure, that movie with Nicolas Cage where he's like, ah. I'm sorry, that's every Nicolas Cage movie. This is one way to enter into the shadow zone of surround sound. And I wish I could tell you it was great and it worked perfectly. It's great, it doesn't work perfectly because it keeps freaking out, but that could just be because I'm, I've got extra. The word extra, you know when they say like, if you're old and you don't know what the word, term extra means, this will define it for you. So I have a surround receiver and this surround receiver outputs analog for the front channels. So when I watch a movie, the analog outputs will go to these amplifiers. If you don't know how it works in my house, the analog outputs go into this ADI, RME ADI2 converter, get converted back to a fiber optic or coaxial digital. They get converted back to a fucking coaxial. So it's taking an analog signal that was digital, making it back digital again, so that I could feed it into and a mini DSP Nano Digi, which then can process the digital signals. And then those digital signals, which are controlling the subs and these amplifiers up front, then get re-decoded because under there, I've got a $300 on each side individualized DAC for that whole thing. And don't forget about the sub control, which is this crown amplifier that has its own DAC coming off of that mini DSP Nano Digi so that everything's got its own DAC and everything is digital to the very last endpoint and it's got its own amplifier. 
That's the definition of extra. So let's complicate that a little bit further or uncomplicate that because this, if this works, if I can get this to work, I might buy a separate surround receiver, just a cheap one, just a cheap Denon off of Accessories for Less or Amazon. And we're gonna talk about refurbish for a second, which I should have done beforehand because refurbished receivers are fine. Um, this thing, its job is to take an HDMI input or two inputs, give you full access in the digital spectrum to all eight channels. And there's eight channels because there's seven speakers and one sub. Gives you access to all of those to do room corrections, crossovers, delay, all the beautiful magical things mini DSP can do. And then spits out HDMI, which you can then put to your receiver. Now your receiver has, you know, that setup where you go through and it's like, well, are your speakers large or small? How far away are your speakers? Okay, what frequency response do your speakers stop at? Those are three basic settings that a receiver can handle. What you would do with this, shut all that shit off. What's the distance? Zero. Are they small? Large. Large would usually mean there's no cutoff. Frequency, all of it. And that way, this unit takes your input, whether it's from a computer or whether it's from a fucking Blu-ray player or whatever it is, fucks it up real good to perfectly match your room when you can input rue corrections and things into this and then spits it out to the receiver and the receiver's only job is to send signal from A to B and B to C and C to D and then everything works based on this which means you don't need a very expensive receiver to do amazing things now we talked about room correction. I should have sent some names of them, and I don't remember all the names. Audacity is probably the most popular one, but this is Audacity DSX and Audacity 2EQ dynamic volume. There are more and better and better. The big one, the big room correction is um, Dirac Live. So this unit, I paid a little under $300 for it. The Dirac Live version is $200 more or $150 more. For just the software, you can actually upgrade this via the USB to be the one that has Dirac Live. And Dirac Live is microphone and internalized corrections. Not time-based, it's not that high-end yet, but frequency corrections for room correction. And you can buy one of these that does that. You can also buy one of these that has individualized analog outputs so that you can essentially skip the receiver altogether, just get eight amplifiers or four stereo amplifiers, and this becomes your surround receiver, but it lacks a little bit of selection. Like example, you only have two HDMIs, the remote control, there's no screen or interface, you don't know what your volume's set at. It's a possibility, it's not great. Now this thing has been giving me issues for a while now, and that sort of sucks because I want it to be great. I, was, I had it working, I had it blending the front channels with a slight delay to the side and then those channels with a slight delay to the back for when I only had stereo content. It was a miracle. But alas, nay. It, it's just too freaked out. I don't know where I am in this video. I feel like it's gone on long enough and you people are losing interest. Or you're super enthralled and you don't want me to stop. It's usually what it is for the people who make it this far. <sighs> We're going back to crazy land. So, I think the basic uh, summation of crazy people is me, where I have the full co digital conversion to bring things to the front, and then convert them back to analog, and I have my own amplifiers up there, and there's no actual, it's all optical cables, so there's no copper touching the front that's touching here. And then trying to add that in on top of the ability to use a mini DSP with the conversions, and oh, by the way, I'm converting coaxial digital to fiber to run it to the front of the room and it's, 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 don't 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 be like me get a surround receiver get a basic surround receiver get i guess the, the overall the majority someone will time stamp this buy the cheapest receiver that does what you need from a brand that i trust and be happy and if you're buying that first and then speakers, always go for efficiency's sake. Because surround receivers have 80, 100, 125 watts, but you know in your heart of hearts that it's not gonna be as clean and as strong as if you've got a separate just amplifier, even a vintage one, especially a vintage one, that does 100, 125 watts. 
Uh, that's why Klipsch is one of the companies I recommend a lot for surround sound because those things are like 97 dB, which means one watt makes them kill you. So instead of trying to stress an amplifier up to near its maximum, it could just relax. It'll live longer. I'm pretty sure this receiver is living longer because I'm not powering the front channels with it. Just the rears, just the rears. It sits here, I dust it every once in a while, it's fine. I think that's it for this episode of Home Theater 102. That's what I'm calling it? I think so. I did another separate video also on picking a subwoofer. I don't know if that was labeled part of the home theater series because that's sort of encountered also for stereo listening. If you guys have any ideas for videos like this where I just rant about a subject on like buying guides and I'm going to link things in the description. Future Zeos who's been having to watch this. Uh, you need to link, oh I was going to discuss refurbished receivers. Another real quick, cheap receivers are fine, more expensive receivers that are refurbished, which means something was wrong, they sent it back, and for the first time in that receiver's life, a capable man or woman looked at it, checked everything, said this is okay now, and sent it back out. That should be worth more. Imagine if your car rolls off the assembly line and they just give it to you. Or imagine your other car rolls off the assembly line, and then a man meticulously goes over everything that could possibly be wrong with it because it had a leak. Oh, I had a leak here. Fix this leak. Let me check this, 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 this. That service is actually more desirable. You want a refurbished receiver. So someone touched it for the first time and it wasn't you. You want more people to touch it that know what they're doing. So don't be afraid to buy a refurbished receiver. In fact, below in the description, Zeos, future Zeos, will be just basically a link to the Denon, Marantz, and Yamaha things, and then a generalized link to refurbished receivers. There's also another site, uh, Accessories for Less, that used to do a lot of refurbished receivers. And the site looks cheesy as hell, but it is a trusted site. It's been known to have like, like the refurbished units from Ankyo and Denon get sent there all the time to be sold and they're under warranty. So I will link to a ton of places in the description that you can look for receivers. And just remember the rules. Pick only the brands that I trust or other reviewers trust don't look at CNET and says, Sony's new receiver. Sony, CNET doesn't give a shit. CNET doesn't fucking care. People who complain to me about this being broken, then I care. So trust re reviewers who are actually out there. Well, I lost my train of thought because I was getting so angry at CNET. Um, pick a budget. Don't go over it because you think you want a feature because you need more specs. Power is irrelevant unless you're tripling the price of something for the same power. And if you're really concerned, you just get any of the units that have a pre-out, either pre-outs for the left and right. And oh, by the way, another thing I should have told you to do. I'll link to this. I'll link to this timeline. When you're looking to buy a receiver, make sure you can find a high res picture of the back of it. Because A, that's like porn to me. Oh God, don't come in here. A, it's like porn to me to look at all the connections, but you find a nice high-res thing, you could look. Wait, does this have pre-outs? Dragging, um, this is me dragging that image. Oh, yep, there they are, there's the pre-outs. <clears throat> does it have zone ones and two, which is something I didn't touch on, but some people will get a surround receiver and it'll also run a kitchen zone or a patio zone, and you can switch them on or off. I have zones two and three for whole house on this receiver, I never use them. If I had another model of this that didn't have that and it was $100 less, absolutely would have bought it because I knew I was never going to use it. So really, really take note of the features and see if there's alternatives out there that will save you money where you don't need that. But look for refurbished stuff. If you can get the next model up and it has a slightly better room to correction or a little bit more power and it's the same price because it's refurbished, fucking do it. I think, I think I've covered it all. If I haven't covered it all, I'm sure I won't rewatch this, but I make 103, like I didn't rewatch 101, and I'm repeating. But we'll go about talking about something else. So subwoofers are, come, subwoofers are covered, we could talk about efficiency of speakers. I don't know, again, if you have any thoughts for the next version of this, or other videos like it. Like, hey Zios, talk about how to place speakers in a space. 
and I could just get a pair of speakers and show you 15 different ways to place them in the space and what will go wrong, what will go right, and speaker heights and turn them upside down because Zio said so. I need to get a drink. I've been ranting now for probably 34 and a half minutes. 34 and a half? I can live with that. Okay, the end. Oh, by the way, that wallpaper is available in the description in case you're interested. If you've never been to Z Reviews, hi, I'm Zeos. I should have done this intro at the beginning. Um, I do mostly headphones and speakers, but I love home theater, but it's very hard to talk about it. Like, how many things can you say? And um, I always include an anime wallpaper, usually, in the description, which you can get all of those on my Patreon, which supports this channel for $2 a month. However, $5 a month gets you into the yard sales and gets to see all these videos early. So the patrons get to see this video for probably a week or two early. And anything I am done reviewing, I had a pair of speakers, a couple of headphones, amps, that mini DSP maybe, will be in the yard sale from the 1st to the 10th of every month. I sell it off, highest bid wins. I ship free internationally, I ship half price, I'm sorry, I fr ship free continental United States, I ship half price internationally. That dude is straight out of Life, Steve Zizu and the Life Aquatic. Only he's carrying a skateboard. He's got pink socks, Jesus. Um, I hope you could see it. $10 tier. So $2 tier wallpaper is basically a few reviews. $5 tier, see every review early, get into the yard sale, ask me questions on Patreon. $10 tier gets you into the private Telegram chat on my phone, which has 190 people in it currently. And all those people know about three times more than I do individually. But I love talking to them anyway, even though they're snobs. No, they're not snobs, they're great guys, but they will tell you to buy very expensive things, more so than even I will. So behind the scenes, like I could take a video, <clears throat> I could rant, I give people direct, on the phone, in my hand responses to their questions. So that's what the $10 Telegram does. And the tiers above that, I'm still working on the actual full benefits, but you are a super fan if you uh, sign up for like the $30 tier. And I thank you, oh my God, that buys dinner. So we done? Have you had, did this video help you? Did this video confuse you more? Should I just write this out, the, the things? Maybe I'll even like go nuts in the description and write like a real, Future Zeos hates me right now, but maybe I won't. Down there will be links to buy these receivers. You have to watch the video to understand why. That's it, we good, we good? Cool. I'm going now. Thank you. See you in 103 in like 18 months.